Well, as with that, a chroeso cynnes iawn i chi gyd i Brifysgol Bangor. Good evening and a, a very warm welcome to you all to Bangor University's annual lecture held in conjunction with the Menai branch of the United Nations Association. These joint lectures have been held for a number of years, each one dealing with an aspect of the work of the United Nations. But this is the first time this event has been held online. The Marshal Kinta Ir Dalithama vote and Rithiol, so Croiso, Irubeth, Sith and Vechreid in the Ama and Rivasco Bangor. Of course, the online nature of the event today is a blessing as well, because it has been able to to attract a truly international audience, and that's very fitting to do so on what is a global theme. We know that over 500 people have registered from all around the United Kingdom and many countries across the globe. And it's a very warm welcome to you all. Croeso cynnes iawn i chi gyd a diolch am ddod a diolch am eich ddiddordeb yn y ddarlith pwysig yma. I'm glad to say that the, uh, the lecture will be recorded and will be available then uh, for more uh, study afterwards. So you are very welcome, whether as an academician, as a practitioner, one of our alumni here at Bangor University, a student, a campaigner, a volunteer or a citizen. All of us must be interested in the future of our planet. And may I extend a warm welcome to you from North Wales, Bangor University, Dioch Amamino Gadani. Now, no doubt a number of you will want to propose questions. So please type in the questions into the live event Q&A pane, which is there on your Teams window. We hope then to take a selection of these and perhaps uh, reduce the questions to a number of themes, which I know that uh, uh, will be um, replied to by Julia uh, at the end of the lecture. We're really grateful for Julia to be able and willing to respond to questions. It is self-evident that climate change is one of the most important issues of our time. Universities have a critical role to play, both in terms of conducting research, which informs decision makers, but also in working with companies, other organisations and governments to deliver the urgent change that is needed. I'm tremendously proud of the groundbreaking climate change work that is conducted here in Bangor University and in North Wales. The work that we are engaged in in Bangor, particularly in terms of the land and sea, the oceans, which is conducted here at our College of Environmental Sciences and Engineering, is really groundbreaking. It's exciting. You feel the buzz. And it's great to see that I am sure the impact of, the research, of this research will make a change for good for our planet, both in terms of sources of energy, including tidal and nuclear energy. I am proud too of the sterling work undertaken to reduce our carbon emissions and use of energy and water to increase recycling and to reduce the use of plastics. It's innovation, it's engagement, it's commitment, which will make so much difference to climate change. It is for these reasons that sustainability is at the heart of our new strategy for the university for the next 10 years. We are passionate about promoting a culture and scholarship of environmental studentship. And our work is informed, of course, by the great well, well-being goals of the Welsh Government and also of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. This November, the United Kingdom will host the 26th Conference of the Parties of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change in Glasgow, the so-called COP26. COP26 
is probably the most significant environmental summit of its time and certainly since the Paris Climate Agreement was signed now over five years ago. Bangor University has applied for observer status and with international partners, we are hoping to organize an event focused on the contribution effective and equitable forest conservation can make to climate change mitigation. We have also, in association with other Welsh universities, proposed an exhibition of Welsh science and innovation to be held in the United Kingdom's government zone at COP26. The name of our proposed exhibition is Small Nations, Big Ideas, which I think captures beautifully the cutting edge research happening here in Wales, which is contributing to a low carbon and more resilient future. Work that I know Professor Julia, jo Julia Jones, our speaker this evening, is at the heart of. So I am really thrilled to introduce my distinguished colleague this evening, whose work is central to this agenda, as I have just said. Julia is Professor of Conservation Science in the School of Natural Sciences. Her research focuses on the impacts of conservation interventions and on the social dimensions of conservation. She is the leader of the Forest for Climate and People project, which aims to ensure that forest carbon programs are more effective and avoid negative impacts on the poor. Julia is also leading a major project to consider how global ecosystem service schemes can be best designed to reduce poverty. I'm also pleased that she has taken on a new leadership in Wales. She's recently been appointed director of the Sair Cymru National Research Network for Low Carbon Energy and Environment. Many of you will have seen Julia uh, in her contribution to the BBC documentary, Extinction, The Facts, presented by, of course, one of our honorary fellows here at Bangor University, Sir David Attenborough. Mae'r agenda yma mor bwysig i'r byd. Mae'n bwysig i ni hefyd yma am Rhyfysgol Bangor. Mae'n rhan anatod o'n strategaeth ni wrth fynd ymlaen. So, my Geni Blesser Maur, I have great pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, to introduce this evening's lecturer, our colleague here at Bangor University, Arathro Professor Julia Jones. Julia. Diolch Yuan, Chrysler Bau, Diolch and Varan Vuad. And Yuan, thank you particularly for that uh, very uh, generous introduction. I'll start with acknowledgements, and I particularly want to thank my co-authors of the work that I'm going to present. Um, I've learned so much from each and every one of them, and thanks also to the funders of my research, particularly uh, UK Aid are funding most of my work at the moment, so thank you. The world is warming, so this is now indisputable, and climate change poses a genuinely existential threat to our way of life. And the impacts of climate change don't recognise international borders and of course international cooperation is vital to address the drivers of climate change. So this is just the sort of challenge that the United Nations was set up to address. And indeed the UN has been critical in trying to bring together global efforts to tackle climate change, most significantly recently in terms of the uh, Paris Climate Agreement that, as UN mentioned, was signed in 2015 by 196 parties. And under this agreement, the nations of the world have committed to keeping warming well below two degrees above pre-industrial levels. Now, to achieve this two degree target, Decarbonising economies is going to be essential, so that involves switching to renewable energy, reducing overall uh, energy consumption. But management of land and natural ecosystems is also really important. And that's because natural ecosystems represent huge stores of carbon, which get released when we burn forests or we drain wetlands. 
the way we manage our timberlands, plantations, croplands, grazing lands, all of this could also have a really big impact on emissions. And if we could restore ecosystems, we can lock up carbon and soak up carbon, remove it from the atmosphere, reducing the harm it does. Together, these are called natural climate solutions, and together they have the potential to contribute about a third of the most cost effective climate mitigation that's going to be needed if we're going to meet this target of keeping warming below two degrees. Now, those boxes along the bottom are very different sizes. Uh, they're all shown the same size, but actually in terms of the potential of these different categories of activity, uh, they have def really quite different potential. But I've highlighted the most important. So um, protecting forests, managing timberlands and restoring forests together, they add up to about two thirds of the total emission reductions possible. And you'll notice they all have something in common. Uh, they all involve trees. Now, trees are the ultimate carbon capture and storage technology. They pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. They lock it up in wood. They uh, enrich the soils with carbon. Um, this year is 50 years since Dr. Zeus published his charming book, The Lorax. So to celebrate this early environmentalist, I've depicted a truffler tree. But all trees essentially work the same way. And of course, trees have other benefits beyond locking up carbon. They provide habitat for biodiversity. They can increase the infiltration capacity of soils, which can slow surface water flooding, something that you know there's a lot of concern about at the moment. There's been some terrible floods here in the UK and around the world. And personally, I just love trees and forests. Uh, here's a picture showing my, my happy place, Coit de Norwig, uh, which is just close to where I live in Llanberis. But professionally, I focus on tropical forests. And tropical forests, they really matter on a global scale um, as a store of carbon. And we mostly tend to think about the carbon that's locked up in the trees, but soils actually matter just as much um, as, as the trees themselves. Tropical forest soils can store huge amounts of carbon and they're incredibly poorly known. For example, as recently as 2017, a paper was published describing the carbon stores uh, in a peatland the size of England, which lies below the Congo rainforest. And it's estimated that this, uh, this peatland alone st stores the equivalent of about three years of global emissions. So you can see why it's really important to keep that carbon locked up. Now, interestingly, tropical forests could also act as important carbon sinks, actively removing carbon from the atmosphere. In theory, a mature forest should just be a store of carbon because it should be in equilibrium. So trees grow and trees die and decompose. So they grow taking up carbon. When they die and decompose, that carbon gets released again. But the elevated levels of CO2 in the atmosphere actually has a fertilizing event effect and has allowed forests to grow, meaning that tropical forests have been actively removing a substantial proportion of the extra CO2 that humanity has been pumping out. Now, worryingly, this is actually starting to reduce because as warming increases, fires, tree death, etc., increase. So this is processes separate from any active deforestation, but kind of natural processes happening as uh, the atmosphere changes. Um, and the amount of carbon being taken up by tropical forests is now reducing. And if warming continues, it's expected that tropical forests will flip from being a net sink of carbon, so taking up carbon, to being a net source of emissions. Um, but my main take home message really is that these tropical forests really matter from a climate change perspective. So as you had mentioned, the next big event in international climate policy since the climbing of the Paris, the signing of the Paris Agreement is the 26th Conference of the Parties of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. You can see why it has this short acronym COP26, um, which we're all looking forward to in Glasgow this year. And I would say that COP is happening at a really exciting time. So 127 countries have come, come have committed that by mid-century, their total emissions will be zero. They're aiming for net zero by, the UK is aiming for it by 2050, China by 2060. And many countries have started to make ambitious nearer term commitments. So for example, the UK has made their commitment uh, to reduce 
um, to 68% relative to 1990s levels of emissions by 2030. And with what Biden in the White House, the US rejoining the Paris Agreement, it really does genuinely feel like, a, like an opportunity in time at the moment. Now, there's growing recognition of the importance of these natural climate solutions that I started by talking about uh, and their importance to climate change mitigation. Um, and in, in recognition of that, there really is a focus in this COP on nature. Uh, one of the main themes of the UK's presidency of the COP is nature. And the Minister Zach Goldsmith has said, there's no path to net zero without a major effort to protect and restore nature. And I think this focus is really positive to see. Let's consider for a minute this concept of net zero and look at the role that forests, and particularly tropical forest conservation, can play. So at its heart, net zero is a really simple concept. So if a country or a company, some companies are committing now to net zero, if they want to achieve net zero, then first they need to reduce emissions as much as possible. But there's recognition that some emissions are inevitable. So measures to remove carbon, uh, carbon dioxide equivalents from the atmosphere are also needed to soak up unavoidable emissions. And then that will result in so-called net zero. For some sectors, such as electricity generation, we really know how to reduce emissions right down. Um, and in fact, forests have a role to play, particularly managed plantations, in decarbonising the construction sector, for example. So replacing um, uh, kind of quite high carbon footprint materials with materials that actually have negative emissions associated with them, such as wood, um, can play a really important role in really reducing emissions from construction. And here in Bangor, there's really exciting work going on around creating new materials from wood, which contribute to uh, reducing emissions in the building industry. Um, and of course, Bangor has been training the foresters needed to produce that wood sustainably for uh, 115 years. So, on the kind of measures to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere side, there's there's rapidly evolving industrial technology to car to capture and ca capture carbon and remove it from the atmosphere. But the technology is somewhere away from being fully operational at scale. So most net zero commitments include plans to restore ecosystems. For example, there's huge potential here in the UK uh, to restore peat bogs to lock up carbon. And you'll probably remember most of you or those who are in the UK, how at the last election, political parties were falling over themselves to make competing ambitious tree planting goals. Um, and there's also real interest in forest restoration around the world. Many countries have made ambitious commitments to large scale forest and landscape restoration. Um, and civil society groups such as EcoV from Sri Lanka are shown here uh, engaging in tree planting. There's many groups around the world very engaged with this, as well as larger scale national initiatives. It is important to note um, here the, the, the sort of forester's mantra of the right tree in the right place, as it is critical to consider um, where you're putting a tree and what tree you're putting there. There's sometimes a naive view that just tree planting is always good. But of course, if you're planting trees on peatlands or on bogs, that can actually re release more carbon than it sequesters. But there simply isn't enough space on this planet to restore enough forests to offset all of the unavoidable emissions or certainly all of the emissions that currently appear unavoidable. Some of the claims being made of how much can be locked up in uh, reforestation initi initiatives are, uh, to say the least, a little bit over ambitious. Um, and it also doesn't make sense to focus just on restoration while ecosystems are still being lost. So at the same time as a focus on restoration, there's also rightly a focus on avoiding loss of ecosystems. And this can be preventing further degradation of peat bogs here in the UK, for example, perhaps by preventing industrial peat harvesting seems like a good place to start. Um, but because the rate of forest loss is highest in tropical countries, a lot of the focus on reducing emissions from deforestation is focused in the tropics. 
and I've had the privilege of working in and on tropical forests, mostly in Madagascar, for my whole career. This is the eastern rainforests of Madagascar. This is a small village where I've spent, uh, spent a few happy years in the early 2000s. I was doing research on sustainability of crayfish harvesting, would you believe? But while living in this village, I got involved in daily life um, and I've kept a strong connection to this place now for 21 years. Um, I go back when, whenever possible. And much of that time, I've been much of the time I've been working on forest conservation, its effectiveness and impact on local communities. I would say that the kind of relationships I have in this village kind of ground the work I do. Um, because I understand, yeah, it gives me a useful perspective on you know, the work I do that is often rather larger scale. And of course, the eastern rainforests of Madagascar store carbon, carbon of global value, as we've been talking, but they're also home to some truly wonderful creatures found nowhere else on Earth. So there's understandable, substantial global interest in keeping these forests standing. And locally, these forests matter too. There's local awareness of the role that forests play in allowing water to infiltrate into soils, for example, keeping rivers flowing during the dry season, perhaps making it possible to um, plant your rice crops in your irrigated fields earlier, also preventing erosion and flooding. And forests also provide really important products used in everyday life, building materials, weaving materials, axe handles, etc. And many people feel a cultural connection to forests. So forests have these global values in terms of the carbon they lock up, but they also have local values as well. But they're being cut down. Now, drivers of deforestation vary around the world, but in the eastern rainforests of Madagascar, the main driver is small scale farming. So farmers will clear an area of forest, grow rice for a few years. As the soil fertility is depleted, they might grow maize, maybe manioc for a few more years, then leave it fallow, perhaps for as long as a decade to regain some fertility before clearing again. Now, there's a common misconception that such slash and burn agriculture, as it gets called, is inherently unsustainable and the land inevitably will have to be abandoned. But at low population densities and with appropriate fallow length, so allowing the land to regain some fertility, this farming system absolutely can be sustained. But it's not highly productive. No one's getting rich from this sort of farming. And it does mean that these forests, with their incredible biodiversity and their globally valued carbon stocks, are being destroyed which can seem quite wasteful and inefficient. And these forests in eastern Madagascar are being lost. So last night I just went onto Google Earth and downloaded these images um, of an area I know very well uh, in eastern Madagascar. And I took an image from when I first arrived in the year 2000 and then the most recent, which is 2018. And you can just see here, this is a 60 kilometer square box and you can see just how much forest has gone in just in the time that I've been working in the country. And nearly all of that forest loss is due to small scale slash and bird farming or Swidden agriculture. Now, as I mentioned, the drivers of deforestation really vary around the world. So small scale, mostly subsistence farming of the sort that's driving forest loss in Madagascar is important in many tropical countries, but large scale commercial land clearance for commodities such as beef, oil palm, that's much more important, particularly in Southeast Asia, uh, South America. Unsustainable logging is also an important driver, particularly of forest degradation. Um, but because of where I work, my talk is probably inevitably skewed a bit towards the issues associated with small scale farming as a driver of forest loss. So in response to the global value of tropical forests in terms of their carbon that's locked up in their trees and in their soils, the UN has developed a mechanism to support poorer countries in their efforts to slow deforestation and forest degradation. And this is known as Red Plus, reducing emissions from deforestation and degradation. But I'll just call it Red Plus. And this was initially proposed by the Coalition of Rainforest Nations, led by Costa Rica, at the UNFCCC conference back in 2005. And initially it was envisaged as part of a global carbon market. And that vision didn't really take off. Um, but Red Plus has evolved in two distinct ways. So countries have developed Red Plus programs. Many tropical forest nations include Red Plus 
in their what are known as nationally determined contributions. So every country in the world, UK included, uh, who are signatures to the Paris Climate Agreement, make these nationally determined contributions of what their commitments are to lower their emissions, their national emissions. And tropical forest countries often use Red Plus as part of that. Um, so a country like Madagascar, for example, will commit to reduce its national emissions and a significant proportion of that will come from slowing tropical deforestation. And richer countries have been supporting such programmes through multilateral or bilateral aid. So, for example, the UK has provided really quite substantial support through the International Climate Fund. And I want to emphasise that that funding is not to offset the UK's emissions. It's it's, it's donor money, it's aid money separate from anything to do with the UK's balance sheet about um, carbon, carbon emission reductions. But while these national programmes were being established, a number of Red Plus projects sprung up around the world, which sell verified carbon credits on a voluntary market. So, for example, if you went on holiday and took a flight and wanted to offset the carbon emitted by that flight, you could offset that uh, by buying avoided deforestation carbon credits. And many such uh, Red Plus projects, as I said, they've sprung up all over the place. There's, there's, about, there's been about 350 at its peak of these, 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 these projects that, that operate through a voluntary carbon market. So what's not to like? I mean, deforestation is bad. We've established that. Efforts to slow deforestation are surely a good thing. But Red Plus as a concept has been very controversial. And for something that seems so logical and straightforward, Red Plus does actually face many, many challenges. Um, and it's not straightforward at all. So, for example, for Red Plus to be effective, it has to be funding genuinely additional forest conservation. So conservation that would not have happened in the absence of the funding from Red Plus. But what does that really mean? And how can you demonstrate it? That's a big challenge. Another issue is leakage. So when a conservation project is essentially displacing pressures from a certain area, but those pressures aren't being removed altogether, they're just being shifted. So the, the, the deforestation is being moved rather than avoided. And that can be extremely hard to demonstrate. Um, and of course, makes it very difficult to know the extent to which Red Plus is indeed delivering emissions reductions or not. But firstly, I'm going to focus on the final one here, challenges of effective social safeguards and equitable benefit sharing. And then I will come back briefly to talk about additionality. So let's think back to this picture that I used to illustrate Swidden agriculture destroying Madagascar's fake rainforests. Uh, this is a picture actually that my husband took of Noeli, uh, a guy we worked with a lot at the time. Uh, he's our sort of age and at the time, we were both in our early 20s then, uh, he was about to have his first child and he was clearing his first plot of land as an independent adult. And many years later, his kids and mine uh, spent a lovely day together uh, and the land he cleared then is now a small farm. Now it's not a great farm and he has to work very hard to make a living, but that land clearance was a real investment in his future and that of his kids. And the central point I want to make is that while forest conservation has global benefits, the carbon and the biodiversity, it also has, and it also has local benefits. So as I said, the people living around the eastern rainforest of Madagascar do, do value the standing forest. They recognise its importance and value. But this conservation also has opportunity costs. So it has local costs in terms of uh, preventing somebody from doing something that they would have otherwise been doing. And where the main driver of deforestation is subsistence farming at the forest frontier, these costs, these opportunity costs, are falling on some of the world's poorest people, like Noelle and his family. But if there are such enormous, enormous global benefits of tropical forest conservation, you know, we started this talk by highlighting just how valuable the forest, the, the carbon locked up in these forests are to avoid catastrophic climate change. If they're so valuable, then surely forest conservation can be implemented in ways that doesn't make poor people poorer and that these benefits, these, these carbon benefits can be captured and shared with those bearing these costs. And that brings us on to social safeguards and benefit sharing. The particular Red Plus project I'm going to talk about was funded by the World Bank, which has very explicit social safeguards 
designed to ensure that no one is made poorer. So affected households, so in that case, those are people who are dependent on forest farming, farming at the forest frontier, which would no longer be able to do that farming. Perhaps people that are dependent on harvesting uh, uh, forest products that would no longer be allowed. Those people need to be identified and provided with some kind of micro development project, might, might be training in new farming techniques or provisions of improved seed. This, this picture shows uh, bean farming, which was introduced as one of these social safeguard projects. Um, and similar schemes can also be funded in the area more broadly to share the benefits of carbon money locally to support changes in land use uh, that, that kind of shift farming practices away from ones that destroy the forest and also to build general legitimacy and local enthusiasm for the, the, the Red Plus actions. So there is this inherent awareness that Red Plus risks making poor people poorer. There, are, there is really a good recognition, I think, amongst people involved in forest conservation and environmental policy that there, are, there can be genuine opportunity cost borne by very poor people when you uh, protect forest. So there are these policies in place to avoid to avoid local costs and avoid making poor people poorer. But there's been relatively little research exploring how this plays out in practice. And from 2014 to 2018, I had the huge privilege of leading a major research project called PAGES, Campaign for Global Ecosystem Services Reduce Poverty. And our aim was to explore the contribution that carbon payments through a Red Plus project could play in alleviating poverty. And part of this project involved a really detailed social, uh, some very detailed social research uh, with communities around a Red Plus project to explore the magnitude and the distribution, both of the costs of conservation as experienced by local people and the magnitude and the distribution of any benefits distributed. So it was really quite an ambitious project. And our thousands of hours of interviews, which included choice experiments, detailed agricultural surveys over a year, um, a contingent valuation study where we followed up two years after people had received their social safeguarding compensation. Um, all of this work delivered rather depressing findings. So we estimated that in total about 6,000 households around the Red Plus project should have been eligible to receive compensation while only about 2,500 were identified by the project according to publicly available documents. And our work revealed that there were serious spatial biases. So those that were identified as eligible to receive compensation uh, tended to be closer to the road, so more accessible to uh, outsiders and agencies doing surveys. They also tended to be more socially connected and more food secure, less food insecure. And even many of those that were identified as eligible never received anything. And our detailed analysis showed that none were fully compensated. And what's particularly noteworthy is that all of our extremely detailed research wasn't needed to show that no one was fully compensated. The publicly available documents of the project showed that the compensation was a one off and that less was spent on it than the project's own estimate, or approximately the same was spent on it than the project's own estimate of annual opportunity cost. So unless micro development projects at the forest frontier in Madagascar have a return rate of more than 100% annually, in which case, can I move my pension there? Uh, it was clear that people were not being compensated. It was clear from the publicly available documents, as well as from our very, very detailed uh, research on the ground. Now, providing agricultural development support across these huge landscapes with really poor infrastructure. People are very uh, widely dispersed in this landscape and it's really tough to get around here. Um, you know, it is difficult, but it is useful to consider the scale of the costs per household, which we estimated as about $2,700 in a net present value. So kind of the current cost projected into the future. If you compare that with how much the carbon avoided by the project would be worth globally if the project achieved the deforestation it hoped to achieve. And for this, we used a very conservative estimate of the social cost of carbon. We used uh, $11 a tonne. So that's quite a conservative estimate in terms of how much it costs to society for every tonne of carbon released into the atmosphere. And if you do that calculation, the figure comes out as about $110,000 per affected household. So obviously that money 
wasn't available. No one's paid that money. It's not, I'm not suggesting that the Red Plus project was somehow corrupt and that money was stolen. No, the problem is that um, part of the problem is that we're not paying, we're not currently paying the social cost of carbon. That's not being paid. Uh, and of course, there are genuine costs to running a Red Plus project. Not all of those, not all of that money, even if it was captured, could be put directly into these development projects. But I just want you to bear in mind the magnitude of those two numbers. You know, it does look like it should be possible to do avoided deforestation in this kind of place without meaning local people are bearing a cost. It should be possible to deliver kind of meaningful and effective development support at the forest frontier, uh, it, that should be affordable. So that's one study in one very specific area highlighting a, a particular problem um, that Red Plus projects can bring social costs, local costs that could be borne by some of the poorest people on the planet and that, um, uh, you know, that they're just not being compensated and they can contribute to making poor people poorer. But what about coming back to this question about measuring additionality and whether Red Plus projects have actually worked in terms of um, slowing deforestation and providing additional conservation that wouldn't have happened in the absence of the investment? You know, has have Red Plus projects slowed deforestation? So. Um, I have the great pleasure at the work moment of working with Alejandro Gizar, who's a PhD student at Cambridge with his supervisors. Uh, and we've been doing a robust impact evaluation, looking at the impact of 44 Red Plus projects from 17 countries. And these are a full sample for which we could get the data we needed. Uh, and we're trying to look systematically at the extent to which these Red Plus projects have slowed deforestation relative to what would have happened in the absence of the project. And globally, deforestation is not slowing down. So despite that, um, the, the large efforts that's been going on for decades in tropical forest conservation, um, deforestation continues. To update the classic 1980s analogy, a football field of old growth tropical humid forest was lost every six seconds, 24 hours a day throughout 2019. So if these forests really matter, which I argue that they do, something surely does need to be done. But I've been highlighting the problems with Red Plus. So does that mean I'm arguing that it should not be part of Red Zero, Net Zero plans. Many of us that are concerned about climate change and tropical forests do get nervous when we see companies or countries promising to achieve Net Zero by offsetting their emissions through attempts to slow deforestation in tropics. And there are, you know, that's partly because of these questions, these very big questions around equity, are poor economically and often politically marginalised people going to bear the costs of allowing richer people to continue business as usual. That's got some very clear environmental justice and ethical questions associated with it. I also worry from a sort of more pragmatic perspective about the very real accounting challenges associated with assuring, ensuring that these offsets are genuinely additional. Uh, one of the main sticking points that's going to be addressed at COP26 is around avoiding double accounting in any avoided offset carbon market. Um, but the world, the world has been trying to slow tropical deforestation for a very long time with limited success. And while carbon money hasn't magically solved all the problems so far and isn't going to, it has certainly provided some much needed financial support. My mother-in-law was having a clear out recently. I mean, my mother-in-law is amazing. She cuts out everything from the newspaper and then files it beautifully. But she was having a clear out recently of some of her older files. Uh, and she sent us articles that she had cut out of newspapers in the run up to the Rio summit 30 years ago. I mean, it's amazing. Uh, and they made for really poignant reading. The hairstyles have dated a bit, but the issues that they're discussing have depressingly not dated at all. This article is talking a lot about deforestation in the Amazon. Now, since then, we've seen a period where forest loss was brought under control in the Amazon, uh, the early part of this century, only for it to increase again, similar to um, rates seen around the time of the Rio summit. The honest truth is that tropical deforestation needs tackling, and this is going to take resources, uh, particularly if we're going to do it equitably. 
And carbon money is a much needed source of money. So just because so far the success has not been brilliant doesn't mean we should just give up. As I've mentioned, the drivers of tropical deforestation are very different in different parts of the world and they will need different solutions and there are no silver bullets. Solutions are inevitably going to need a complex mix of policies, including land tenure reform. I think that's going to be central in places like Madagascar, and I'm very happy to talk about more that more and take questions later. Um, addressing deforestation in international supply chains of major commodities like uh, oil palm, etc., is also important. Changing consumption patterns. There's no getting away from it, but we're going to have to change our consumption patterns. But I personally believe that a well-regulated offset market involving avoided deforestation carbon credits with stringent regulation at a realistic carbon price that covers local opportunity cost is probably part of the solution. But key is that we learn from the last 30 years of experience of forest conservation in general and then the last 10, 15 years of Red Plus particularly. Doing the work I do can be depressing but working at a university gives me hope. Uh, conservation scientists around the world have been studying what worked and what hasn't worked in forest conservation and why. And these days there's much better integration of the different disciplines that need to be brought, brought to bear to tackle something as complex as tropical deforestation. So you're now seeing more and more work done where ecologists are working with economists, anthropologists, psychologists, etc. the full range of disciplines. We're also seeing researchers engaging more with policymakers, uh, which I think is critical and really important. And there's a whole new generation of bright and motivated students who are studying the lessons of the past and applying them in their work. A few years ago, I had the, you know, the huge pleasure of teaching on one of Bangor's distance learning forestry summer schools in Ghana. And we had students from 30 we have 30 students from 20 nationalities and many of them are people, these are distance learning students and many of them are already in established forestry careers. And we were all together in the field for two weeks. I learned so much. And the course was co-taught by uh, Professor Philip Nieko, who's there in the Bangor t-shirt in red. Uh, he's an alumnus of Bangor. He did his PhD here uh, and he's now Professor of Forestry at Makerere University in Uganda. Um, and in total, Bangor's forestry programmes have graduated students from over 100 countries over the past few decades. And I do believe that the lessons can be learned from the past. You know, there's no simple lesson, there's no silver bullet, but if engaged and critical thinkers put their minds to work and work together, I do believe that tropical forest conservation can be made more effective and crucially more equitable. So, my final slide, what should a concerned citizen be hoping for at COP26? So firstly, I would say high ambitions. So countries were obliged to update their Paris com commitments by the end of 2020. And these updated commitments are now coming in thick and fast, a little bit later than originally planned, but there was this small pandemic. Um, there is concern, however, that most are not ambitious enough to provide the reduction in warming that's needed. The main focus of this COP is going to be on agreeing the details of how a carbon market is going to operate that can help countries decarbonise at lower cost. And this is the final part of the Paris rulebook that needs to be agreed. And these negotiations around what's known as Article 6 do have the potential to make or break the agreement. So some countries, the UK included, they've said they won't use international carbon credits to meet their national commitments. So Britain, yes, it is going to use natural climate solutions to, to reach net zero eventually and reach its 60%, reach 68% its reduction from 1990 emissions levels. It's going to use natural climate solutions, but those are going to be within the UK. So it's going to be restoring peat bogs, planting trees, etc. But many countries do do plan to um, uh, use, to use some technical jargon, these internationally traded mitigation outcomes. So trading carbon uh, emissions reductions between countries, some of which can be provided by Red Plus. But there's also a market which companies such as airlines can then um, trade their emission reductions through. So this is what's known as the sustainable development mechanism and it to be technical here, replaces what you might have heard of as the clean development mechanism under Kyoto. So essentially, as well as the national commitments to reduce um, 
emissions at the national level. There's also the idea that there should be some kind of a regulated market, uh, particularly there's a particular focus on airlines being able to, because for example, the UK has omitted aviation from its national determined contributions. So credits from Red Plus could both be part of these national commitments, although not in the case of the UK, uh, but also uh, in terms of um, the sustainable development mechanism. And these detailed rules that are going to be agreed at COP, COP26 really matter for the outcomes for tropical forests and for the 1.2 million people who live in and around them. So I would end by saying the recognition that natural ecosystems, including tropical forests, are so critical to the success of Paris Agreement, the Paris Agreement, that is really welcome. But as always, the devil is in the detail. Diochem Grando, am Rando, Dwyd Gwybod Bord, Pau, Woody Kyle, Llond, Ball, Ozoom, Arhenobreed. So thank you very much for, for listening to me this long. <laughs>